Today, I'm testing recipes from five of the top foodie YouTubers, besides me. And did you know they all share two things in common? They all have cookbooks and one-star reviews. And as this video goes on, the reviews will get worse. As a cookbook author myself, let's just say I've had my fair share of unsavory reviews. But today, let's see if the one-star reviews are true or not. And if they're not, I have to leave an honest five-star review. So let's get started with... Joshua Weissman, shall we? So this is Joshua Weissman's new book, Texture Over Taste. Joshua Weissman has nine million subscribers on YouTube and he's best known for his butt better series, or at least that's how I found him. But as this one star brutal review points out, I thought he would have learned his lesson from all the errors in his first book. His creme brulee recipe doesn't even include when to add sugar in the instructions. That's a pretty significant mistake. And once again, there are weight conversions errors all over the place. I shouldn't have to troubleshoot recipes and mark the book up with pen to fix everything. It's embarrassing, lazy, and I'm disgusted by this blatant cash grab. I would return, but it was a gift. The review in question here is the lavender creme brulee. Let's go ahead and make this and we'll see if he really did forget to add the sugar in the directions. So first we start by preheating the oven to 325. So the review also mentioned that the measurements are off. So now I'm gonna have to measure everything. You know, it's serious when you need a scale because I typically do not weigh it this way. Two cups is good enough for me. We are at the two cups mark, 468 milliliters. I do not think that I have enough to get to 500 milliliters. So technically you would need two of these guys because even on the measurements here, it says 473 milliliters. And we are just over two cups. Now we need 125 milliliters of whole milk, 126. You know, here's the thing. In America, we use the cup system, so I wouldn't try to do two of these. For the home chefs, sticking to cups would have been so much easier. One vanilla bean, split lengthwise, fancy. One teaspoon of culinary lavender. The fact that I already had some culinary lavender is astounding. And kosher salt. Heat it up until steamy and hot, then turn off the heat and allow it to infuse for three to four minutes. The lavender Lavender smells so nice and it adds a very nice floral touch with the vanilla beans. So while this is cooking, we work on the egg yolks. And it appears that the review was right and there is an error in the recipe writing. Let's see, he had two senior editors, a copy editor, a recipe tester, and proofreader. That was four people that missed it. So I'm not gonna put the whole onus of this on him. Somebody should have caught it at the publishing company. So because the sugar was written in the ingredients but not in the directions, I'm I'm gonna be following the directions and we're gonna see what happens. We need five. Okay, so strain a third of the cream mixture into the egg yolks, a teaspoon at a time, a teaspoon at a time, <laughs> to slightly warm the egg yolks. If you need me, I'll just be here scooping a teaspoon of cream into the egg yolks. I guess this is to slowly temper the eggs and warm it up without having it curdle. He's worked in fine dining, high-end restaurants, very highly respected, so I'm gonna trust the process. I'm just gonna dump the rest in. Now we mix to combine and slightly warm the egg yolks. Actually, that created a really nice pale yolky cream mixture. Strain the rest of the cream mixture into the egg yolk mixture. It's very fragrant. I see speckles of my vanilla bean in there. Stir until thoroughly combined. Very silky, very smooth, very yellow. Pour the custard mixture into four six ounce ramekins. Place ramekins into a baking dish large enough to hold them all. Fill the dish halfway with boiling water and place in the oven to bake for 30 to 40 minutes or until centers are barely set. Remove the ramekins from the oven and cool completely to room temperature. It's cooled down and it looks pretty good. It firmed up quite a bit but still jiggly. Cover with plastic wrap and refrigerate over Night. All right, it's the next day. They look good. The top has softened up a little bit. There's some dimples. When ready to serve, top each custard with a thin coating of sugar, about one to two teaspoons that cover the custard from edge to edge. I'm gonna go with a max of two. I'll be using a kitchen torch. If you're using a kitchen torch, carefully brush the top with the flame until the sugar has melted and browned. My torching skill needs work. The best thing about a creme brulee is always that first crack. Wow. Ooh. Yes. Silky smooth. Wow, so creamy. Mmm. 
Look how creamy this is. I definitely taste the lavender infusion in here. Cause I didn't use extra sugar in here. Definitely, but the technique in itself, this is probably the silkiest creme brulee I've ever made. And with the sugar on top, it is sweet enough. I mean, you shouldn't be eating that much sugar anyways. Here's my review. Beautiful photography with easy to understand instructions. Minor detail left out, but the ingredient is listed there. And too much sugar is overrated anyways. Probably the silkiest creme brulee I've ever made, and I even learned a new technique to temper my eggs. I'm gonna keep this book. Five stars. Before we move on to our next YouTuber, B-roll. Next up, we have Molly Baz, where more is more. I first met Molly on the Bon Appetit channel where she always made really cool, delicious things. But in recent years, she moved to LA and she has her own channel now with 128,000 subscribers. And here's a one-star review about her cookbook. I love cookbooks, for real. I'm that person who buys cookbooks and read them like novels, marking the pages, making grocery lists, and excitedly coming home to make all the recipes. However, after buying this book, I had a new feeling. It wasn't joy or excitement, it was confusion. Am I not hipster enough for this cookbook? It seems to be aimed at a young 20-something who's looking for an edgy cookbook. I'm 38, so I like to think I'm not ancient, but this book has me questioning everything. Here's my issue with this book. We have a novel here. The font in this book is absolutely horrible. Why would someone choose a practically illegible font to put in their book? There are zero nutritional facts. I'm a certified functional nutrition counselor who is a foodie to the max, but not having any clue what a serving size should be or what a basic nutrition for each recipe is a major red flag for me. More flavor is great, more sodium may not be. There are lots of weird LA party pictures that have no place, again, maybe more of a hipster vibe. I did make one of the recipes to be fair to the author. I made the pepperoni fried rice. It was easy as indicated on the page. There ends the praise for this recipe. This meal was greasy AF and had a quarter of mayo on aioli on the bottom of each plate. The font, the flavor, the grease, it was all gross. One star. Ouch, 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 ouch. Okay, well let's let's dissect this. The font on the cover looks fun. I can read it. It's a design choice. It's her vibe. But these fonts are clearly legible. So these LA party, there's only one and it's her having a drink for stock your bar. Makes sense. It's a lifestyle photo. This is just her setting up the vibe, the scene for the cookbook. It just looks very vintagey, and it has its own unique style, which I think is good. I think it's good to be different when you're creating a book to stand out. There's a lot of cookbooks out there that look exactly the same, and that's boring. Zero nutritional facts. Joshua Wiseman's didn't have any nutritional facts. My book didn't have any nutritional facts. I think if you're looking for a health book, that would make more sense. And I have to say, as a certified functional nutrition counselor why would you choose to make a pepperoni fried rice anyways <laughs> okay so first things first let's do some prep we're gonna cut four ounces of sliced pepperoni in half creating half moons I have to say I've never had pepperoni fried rice before but this reminds me of the Chinese style one where they use like Chinese sausage lapsung then we're gonna smash thinly slice eight cloves of Garlic, that's a lot of garlic, but she also says that's why it's so good. Thinly slice one shallot and pick the leaves from one bunch of basil. That's a lot of basil. Okay, next, make a quick aioli in a small bowl with together one cup of mayo. So I have my one cup of mayo here. How do I know? Because I made it. Two grated garlic cloves. Ah, oops, and a pinch of salt. Season with sherry vinegar. I my sherry vinegar. I don't have sherry vinegar, I have white wine vinegar. To taste, it'll take a tablespoon or so before it starts to taste really bright and delicious. Mm, I'm gonna add another tablespoon. So we're looking for bright and delicious. I thought it was gonna make the mayo super sour, but it doesn't. It's just, like she says, really bright. Three tablespoons and we are there. All right, next up, we fry the rice. In a large nonstick skillet, heat three glugs of olive oil over medium heat, a technical term. Add the pepperoni and cook, stirring often until about half of the pepperoni has crispy edges, four to five minutes. Using a slotted spoon, transfer the cooked pepperoni to a plate. Add four cups of cooled cooked rice, season with salt, and pat into a single layer. Cook undisturbed until the rice is very crispy and evenly golden brown underneath six to eight minutes. Using a heat proof rubber spatula, fold the rice pancake in half like an omelet, kind of like a 
Tulsa bibimbap. Add another glug of olive oil to the bare spot in the skillet, along with the garlic, shallots, and a few pinches of red pepper flakes. I'm gonna say, I think I need a little more glug of olive oil. Reduce the heat to medium low and cook until the shallot has softened, but not brown. One to two minutes. This is like a one pan hack. Add the pepperoni back into the skillet and break up the rice, stirring the pepperoni and aromatics into the rice as you break it up. Once the ingredients are incorporated, remove the pan from heat, stir in a few clogs of sherry vinegar and basil leaves. They will wilt with the heat and that's what we want. Taste and adjust the seasoning with salt. Let's just try rice first. I think it's good. Generously smear the aioli on the bottom of a serving bowl. I'm gonna go ahead and say she did not call for a quarter cup. Pile the pepperoni rice on top and serve hot. Some aromatics in there. I'd say this looks pretty exact to what the photo has here. Let's get some of that controversial aioli in there to see if it's really greasy. There's no like greasy oil. Like when, when a fried rice is greasy, you know it's greasy. Is it different? Yes, I can confidently say I've never had pepperoni fried rice before, but is it bad? I would say no. This is something you could definitely eat after a late night partying session, which I mean, when else would you eat pepperoni fried rice? I think I'm ready to write my review. Pepperoni fried rice is a late night food revelation. I'm not 20, but I think this book has style, vintage style that takes me back to the 70s. Fun and easy to read with food combos I never would have thought of. Five stars. Next up, we have Claire Saffitz, dessert person. We first met Claire through Bon Appetit, but now she has her own channel at 1.2 million subscribers. Honestly though, I feel bad doing this review because can Claire really do any wrong? She's made us pocky sticks and peeps for crying out loud. Let's see what this one star has to say. I like Claire Saffitz. She's very charming and hashtag relatable, but every recipe I've tried out of this book has been a disaster. I'm not a pro, but not a novice baker either. Things I try to bake from recipes usually turn out well. This book just is not for me, I guess. Chocolate chip cookies came out super flat, crunchy, and overdone. I don't know if it's the equipment, ingredients, or untested instructions, but this book doesn't work for me. One star. So being a chocolate chip connoisseur myself, I think that just makes sense to try out that recipe and see if it is crumbly, flat, and overdone, like they say. She calls for two sticks of unsalted butter. Measure out four ounces of butter and set aside in a large bowl. In a small saucepan, cook the remaining four ounces of butter over medium low heat until the butter sputters, foams, and eventually you see brown bits floating about five to seven minutes. Add the brown butter to the bowl with the other butter, making sure you scrape in all the brown bits. Then add heavy cream, two tablespoons, no need to stir, set aside, and cool. I have such the urge to stir, but she says no need to stir. In a medium bowl, whisk together flour, salt. She specifically mentions diamond crystal kosher salt. In the baking and cooking community, they're very picky about the brands of their salt. And baking soda to combine. To the bowl with the brown butter mixture, it can be slightly warm, just make sure it's not hot. Add the brown and granulated sugars and whisk vigorously until the mixture is very smooth and thick. About 45 seconds. Since we're not going for a light and cakey cookie texture, you don't need a mixture that's light and fluffy. I forgot I was supposed to use a whisk. I'm just not used to using a whisk for this part. Add the egg and vanilla and whisk until the mixture is satiny about 45 seconds. Mmm, smells very good with the vanilla. Add the flour mixture and whisk until the batter is smooth and well combined. It'll look a little loose, this is normal. Switch to a flexible spatula to scrape down the bowl, folding to make sure everything is well incorporated. It does look loose. All right, here is where I run into problems. The recipe calls for chocolate discs. I don't know what kind she's using, but these are my chocolate discs. They're huge! And you're supposed to leave some whole and some coarsely chopped. This is where I'm gonna have to go with my instincts. Add both the chocolates, whole disc and chopped, and mix to combine. Set the batter aside for five minutes to firm up slightly. Now we scoop and chill the dough. Using a two ounce scoop or a quarter cup measure, scoop level portions of dough and place on parchment lined baking sheet as close together as possible. You'll space them out before baking. Cover the sheet tightly with plastic wrap and refrigerate for at least 12 hours and up to 48 if you're pressed for time. A couple hours in the refrigerator will do. Just note that the baked cookies won't be as chewy or as wrinkly looking. 12 hours or more like 18 hours? 
videos later. Preheat the oven and prepare the pans. When you're ready to bake, arrange two oven racks. I'm just gonna bake one in the middle rack. Preheat to 350 degrees. Line two rim baking sheets with parchment paper. Place six pieces of chilled cookie dough on each of the prepared baking sheets, spacing them so they're at least three inches apart. Bake the cookies on the upper and lower racks until they're dark golden brown around the edges. 18 to 22 minutes, switching racks and rotating the sheets front to back after 12 minutes. They're definitely more on the golden brown side and these are the thin and crispies, but now I'm supposed to let it cool for five minutes. All right, it's been five minutes and the cookies have gotten a little bit wrinkly, which is definitely, I think, the look that we're supposed to go for. It looks like a lacy, thin, crispy cookie. The flavor is really nice. I love the crispy edges. There's a definite chew there, but I love that the crispy is really crispy. Mm. I'm ready for my review. After baking from this book, I'm definitely a dessert person. Recipes and instructions are very thorough. I love the thin and crispy chocolate chip cookies. Not crumbly at all, but it does require some extra planning ahead of time. This is a serious YouTuber cookbook for a serious baker. One thing I also noticed is that hers out of all the other YouTubers is the only one without her face on the cover. Five stars. Our next one star victim is actually one of my favorite foodie YouTubers, Mang Chi. She has 6.9 million subscribers and is what I call the Korean auntie we never had. No, actually I do have a Korean auntie. No, do I? I love her and her recipes are solid. Except this one star review said, I've been searching for a Korean cookbook to add to my library. I ended up purchasing this book based on the reviews. I made the famous Korean dish bulgogi and it was not good at all, bland, very bland and tasteless. I've had this dish many times before elsewhere and it was delicious. Followed the recipe as directed and use ingredients as specified. The recipe was easy to follow, hence the one star, but I would not have given it any stars for the taste. I'm so disappointed as I spent money on the meals and ingredients and as one knows ingredients prices have all gone up. What a waste of time and money. Well, we have lettuce wrap, pulgogi rice, tosirak. So first I'm supposed to combine soy sauce, sesame oil, sugar, garlic, scallion, sesame seeds, pepper, and one tablespoon of water into a bowl. Mix well until the sugar has dissolved and then add the beef and mix well with a spoon or by hand. So this doesn't look like a ton of marinade, but for the beef, she only calls for four ounces. So I'm gonna have to slice and measure it. I'm using top sirloin here. She calls for beef sirloin or tenderloin, which is filet mignon. And that stuff expensive. Dosia rack also, from what I know, is supposed to be like a little lunch box. So that explains why you're not getting like a ton of meat. This is not dinner portion. All right, to cook this, we're gonna heat a medium skillet over high heat. Now she doesn't say to add oil. Add the marinated beef and cook for two to three minutes, stirring with a wooden scoop until the beef is no longer pink and the marinade has evaporated. So far, oh my gosh, it smells like a Korean barbecue restaurant. I'll cook, remove from skillet, and allow the meat to cool. We have one cup of freshly cooked fluffy rice, and then we have six lettuce leaves. Divide the rice in six equal portions. Put a lettuce leaf in your palm, add a portion of rice. Although, I feel like I should try the pulgogi by itself and see if it's actually flavorful or not. Could it marinate overnight to really get into the grains of the beef? Yes, that always makes it taste a lot better. But this is super flavorful. I taste the soy, you get a little bit of sweetness. It's almost as if when you go to Korean barbecue where you grill your meat in front of you, that's what it tastes like. It's delicious with a hint of saltiness. But the thing is you're supposed to add it to the wrap and then you add the samjang, which she also gives the recipe for on a different page. And then you wrap it like this so that you get different flavors and texture. The only thing this is missing is kimchi. Mm. You gotta have it with the samjang. It's mukbang time. I have to write my review. Mang Chi can do no wrong. I love her. I made the quick bulgogi for lunch in 15 minutes. There's two bulgogi recipes in the book. One that takes 30 minutes to marinate and is a soupy noodle dish that I can't wait to try. There's another one that is more straightforward and simple when you don't have time. Perfect for lunch. I'll be a Korean expert by the time I'm through with this book. Mm. Five stars. And last but not least, we have the biggest one of them all. 
Nick DiGiovanni at 15 million subscribers with his book called Knife Drop. Oh wait, no, I'm not actually gonna do that. I feel like his book got the most trolls and brutal one-star reviews of them all. You know what they say, the higher you are, the farther they try to get you to fall. Several one-star reviews. My young son was very inspired by him. We tried five recipes exactly, every one of them a disaster. I'm sure he's an awesome chef, but his instructions don't give us the right results. This is not a good chef. His recipes are not easy to make, some fall apart when making them, and flavor is not good. He is too young and inexperienced to be a chef and especially to write a book. After a few failures, I tossed the book in the garbage or you can use it as kindling to start a fire. Otherwise, totally worthless. And last but not least, this book is so simple the author and Gordon Ramsay, who wrote the foreword to this book, should be embarrassed to have published it. There is a recipe for a BLT in this cookbook. Really? I regret buying it and wish I could get my money back. Also, a lot of the one-star reviews were really mad about the soup chapter because he has this chapter that says soups while it has time and a place soup lacks texture and excitement no recipe index and when you open it up to the soup chapter you get an error oops soup is not found i thought that was super funny unless you know the soup nazi where he says no soup for you i guess you wouldn't understand but i got the joke okay but what we're gonna do today is the finally a good blt it's actually not that simple so to make the maple and lemon bacon, I first have to preheat the oven to 425, line a baking sheet with foil, and place a wire rack on top of the foil. Now I arrange the bacon evenly across the baking rack. Using a pastry brush, coat the bacon with half of the maple syrup and sprinkle half of the brown sugar on top. Place the sheet in the oven and bake about 12 minutes or until the sugar has started to caramelize. Flip the bacon, brush with the remaining maple syrup, and sprinkle with the remaining brown sugar. Bake for 12 to 15 minutes more depending on your design desired crispiness. Remove the sheet from the oven, use a microplane grater, immediately grate some lemon zest over the top so that the zest sticks to the glaze as the bacon cools. <sighs> Place the tomato slices in a single layer on a work surface and season with salt and pepper to taste. Now onto the bread. Using a pastry brush, lightly coat one side of each slice of bread with mayonnaise, about half a tablespoon per slice. The guy loves his pastry brush. In a nonstick skillet, melt one tablespoon of butter over medium high heat. Place one side of bread in the skillet, mayonnaise side down, and toast for five to six minutes or until golden brown. Repeat with the remaining slices. Use a pastry brush to brush the untoasted side of the bread with a thin layer of mayonnaise. Add some chopped bacon so it sticks to the mayonnaise. Layer two leaves of baby romaine lettuce atop the bacon. Add four tomato slices and top the tomatoes with some crispy chicken skins. Serve immediately. But I do have to say, this is a beautiful looking BLT. Is this finally a good BLT? Let's try it. Whoa, there's just so many different textures and flavors that I get that kind of just layers in each bite. The saltiness from the crispy chicken skin, and then the bread is super flavorful. The freshness because of the thick sliced tomatoes like here, and then with the bacon, you get the sweetness. Like the lemon zest goes together really well with the tomato. It was a lot of work for this BLT, but I assure you, it is not simple and something to scoff at. The BLT recipe in this book is anything but basic. It's actually really good. This book is easy enough for beginners, but with flavor complexity is good enough for more experienced cooks. Gordon Ramsay would be so proud. The recipes came together beautifully with very detailed instructions. It's as if I can almost hear Nick reading it to us. Five stars. So as a cookbook author myself, I would say that I thoroughly enjoyed each and every one of these recipes. And I know they put in a lot of heart and hard work into creating these books. And what I love about this one star trend is that you really should be finding the positives out of things and not always look for the bad. Give this video a like and watch the next one. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.